Welcome to Don't Fear the Weight podcast with your host Vicky Masita, bringing together science and personal experience. Hi guys, welcome back to the next episode of Don't Fear the Weight with me, your tiny titan host. Look, I've even got the shirt to prove it today. For you guys not listening and just listening to it on that, not listening, no, not watching, and just listening to it on iTunes, I am wearing a tiny titan t-shirt, which is amazing. And um, my guest as well is wearing his own t-shirt to promote his own self as well. Um, It's Danny Lennon. Hi, Danny, how are you? I'm very good, Vicky. Thanks so much for uh, having me. Oh, absolutely. I've been excited to talk to you. We obviously had a little bit of a brief chat on the TRA podcast that we do, all in terms of uh, water manipulation for weight cutting. Um, Mm. But for people who haven't listened to that and who don't know who you are because they've always been living under a rock somewhere for the last couple of years, um, would you just give a little bit of a background about who you are and what you do as, as a profession? Yeah, for sure. So I suppose the things that are most relevant to today and why people might care about some of the stuff <laughs> I'm saying is uh, from an educational standpoint, I have a master's degree in nutritional sciences uh, from University College Cork. Um, previous to that, I did an undergrad in biology and physics. And uh, since uh, kind of graduating, uh, I've spent the kind of last number of years working with clients so typically how most people get started working from a small base building that up and up um, both in person and then eventually became all online and then back in 2014 I set up Sigma Nutrition which a is a company I describe as uh, one that wants to put out educational media content uh, around evidence-based nutrition and as part of the company we also have a coaching side and just for um, what a number of reasons primarily because of my own interest in uh, martial arts and boxing and MMA, um, as well as uh, competing in some of those sports in the past and getting to know a few fighters. Uh, I eventually started working with quite a, a number of um, combat sport athletes on their nutrition and weight cuts. I ended up writing a bit of a book about that. And so in terms of a lot of the clients that I personally have handled over the past number of years, a lot of them have been either high-level amateur or professional boxers and uh, MMA fighters. Um, But our other coaches at Sigma also take care of a a vast number of other people. So they're some of the kind of primary things in terms of my own coaching and and educational background. And like I say, then Sigma Nutrition is about putting out good content. And probably what we're most known for right now, at least, is the podcast Sigma Nutrition Radio, uh, which I host each week. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, enough to get us started and I'm happy to talk about anything specifically you, you wish. Fantastic. So the whole idea of this particular episode of the podcast was that it's going to be a bit different because we don't normally talk about um, fighting sports and grappling and, and martial arts and things purely for the simple fact and I'm going to say for selfish reasons I don't know a lot about it um, but like you said I'm I want to kind of educate as many people as we can by having fitness professionals like yourself on here. So I learn a little bit more and everybody else learns a bit more for their base knowledge. So we're going to have a look at um, how you manipulate your nutritional strategies for your fighters to ensure that their performance is top notch. And then having a look into their fight prep, um, because that is going to be so much different than a competition prep based for a Mm. bodybuilder or for um, a powerlifter or something along those lines. So let's have um, kind of two case studies as such, imaginary case studies. And if we could have a look at, say, say somebody comes to you who has never fought before um, and says, oh, no, let's not do that because that's really silly. Um, But let's say if they are a fighter and they want to just get that little bit more of a performance edge, what would your initial setup be for them and how would you um, look at their nutrition? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, uh, actually a lot of it will, will parallel with other sports and maybe what people might try and do with other athletes when you first uh, start working with someone uh, and trying to see what the athlete is currently doing and what we can change to improve performance and recovery. So the big thing that I see with fighters that might be different to say someone competing in team sports, um, but the, but the this is also very relevant to say powerlifters as well, is that they can tend to underfuel themselves uh, compared to the workload that they actually put in place. So a lot of these uh, combat sport athletes will do large volumes of training, um, particularly some of the people at slightly higher levels could be training multiple times per day. Uh, but even outside of that, even recreational 
uh, fighters can uh, like train four, five, six times a week, pretty high intensity sessions. But there's, I suppose, a, a culture within the sport either from people misunderstanding what good quality nutrition is. So they start eating the same way someone would eat for fat loss or think I need to eat just vegetables and chicken and nothing else. And so they end up a lot of the time under eating total calories compared to what they should do to fuel their training for optimal performance. And also one that has kind of crept in over this was the past decade, just given its uh, popularity within the mainstream is under eating carbohydrate. And for a sport like boxing or MMA or judo or uh, jiu-jitsu, the, the nature of those sports, they're very demanding on glucose and glycogen. And so trying to do those with a low carbohydrate intake is very problematic. So there are two of the big things that we kind of look for straight away. Is the athlete eating enough food total to fuel this training? Are they consuming enough carbohydrate total to fuel this? And then we can start looking at, okay, what are they consuming before and after training sessions, how often they're doing it, and really just trying to go with that mantra of how can we match up their food intake to account for this type of um, training load. Uh, the next part of that, which is probably what we'll get into for most of the, the rest of this conversation, is then deciding what is the actual goal of their nutrition right now. So trying to maximize your performance in any sport is going to be quite a different task than trying to, say, decrease body fat over an next period of time or having to get quite a lot of weight off an athlete who has maybe um, gained too much weight in the off-season, for example. So trying to assess what is the main goal right now and how do we kind of balance those two. So the kind of interesting thing with fighters, and the same goes with, say, a powerlifter, uh, is if you have someone who wants to have their best performance and recovery in the gym, but at the same time needs to keep a check on their body weight. And so there are two kind of conflicting goals almost because to get your best performance and recovery in the gym, as everyone who has ever tried it, if you're eating in a, like a calorie surplus and loads of food coming in, you feel great, performance is always going to be at best, but that's counter to what you would need to do in order to decrease body fat over time and start losing weight. So it's a kind of delicate balance between the two of those. So the, the very first thing we do with anyone is like assess what they're doing right now, look out for some of those red flags in terms of how much they're fueling overall, uh, carbohydrate, protein intakes, look at hydration status, all the basics that you would probably do with a lot of people and see where do we need to start uh, improving at this particular person. Okay, cool. So in terms of, I'm just going to do a comparison just because of um, understanding wise as well, comparing it to a powerlifter as well then, because um, the powerlifters are going to be using a different energy system, are they not, to do that high explosive one, whereas obviously your fighters are going to need um, a lot more endurance capabilities too, as well as that that quick reflex. I suppose it is going to be the same kind of energy system though, isn't it, because of their quick reflexes? Am I, am I along the right lines there? I mean, so the big distinction between, say, a power lifter and some of these uh, combat sport athletes we have is probably going to be their, the necessity of high amounts of carbohydrate and the timing of carbohydrate as well. So if you take a power lifter, even at a pretty high level who's doing a pretty hard training, the demand for carbohydrate intake on any given day, and especially the timing across that day, isn't as important as someone who is going to be uh, competing in, like I say, MMA or boxing, where they might have two, three sessions per day. And if you take any one of those sessions, like a sparring session in boxing, it's going to be so much more what we call glycolytically demanding. So it has a higher demand for using glucose or carbohydrate to fuel that type of activity uh, versus, say, uh, most typical powerlifting sessions. So I would say the a uh, big distinction is on average, we don't want a powerlifter really having to go too low on carbohydrate. They can still get quite a benefit from consuming an adequate amount. But the importance of very high intakes or timing carbohydrate specifically across the day isn't as important because they may have four to five uh, training sessions over across the week. And the intensity in terms of um, demand for carbohydrate isn't going to be as high as, as boxing. Uh, now, this obviously depends on their, the phase of their training, how much volume they're doing, all that type of stuff. Uh, but in general, it's still not going to reach the same level of importance as it would for 
a fighter. So that the practical difference then is once you have a powerlifter consuming enough calories overall, eating protein uh, across the day in high enough doses, getting enough carbohydrate that they're actually able to uh, recover and, and fuel those training sessions, you're kind of good. With a, a fighter, you need to be more specific with getting a higher intake of carbohydrate, particularly for high intensity days, um, as well as timing that across the day because they'll probably be doing two to three sessions each day as well god that's hardcore isn't it do you know when i'm cutting down i just do cardio and then my training session i think that's hard enough right and i, I think we'll probably point out this is not every single person that does some sort of combat sport this is someone that's like competing at a, a quite uh, like say high level amateur or even professionally which is some of the people we work with they would be getting this number of sessions per week but again it's just uh, the the c- weird thing about fight sports, just the culture, like that's just normal now. Yeah. Like, you know, like most of them are just thinking that they're going to be doing two sessions per day and just like, that's how it is. So, right. Um, and those yeah. sessions, just out of curiosity and, and moving away from nutrition, just for, for the odd question, um, out of curiosity then, do they use like an undulating approach on a daily basis? So will they do like a high intensity burst in the morning and then do maybe like a mediocre in the afternoon? Yeah, so depending on their uh, strength and conditioning coach, and there's quite a lot of variability here, uh, we've often had fighters come to us who have just been winging it, going along their own thing, where they'll have structured um, like skill sessions or sparring sessions in the evenings, and they'll do their own S&C earlier in the day, but that could be like literally anything that's not properly periodized. They just go out and work hard at a particular thing, and it's not all that useful. Those that are working with a good S&C coach will probably have it periodized properly and it probably should be matched up with looking at where their priority training sessions are across the week. So obviously if they have a uh, a big sparring session on a Tuesday evening, it's probably best not to go and do lots of intense interval runs that morning, right? And so they break it up that way. So for the guys that are doing it right, there there is quite a, a bit of... Um, undulation in terms of which sessions are more intense uh, but it, it's it's still pretty cool to see how a lot of their these guys are just able to stay pushing at pretty high intensities across the whole week um oftentimes the biggest job for an snc coach is to get these guys to pull it back a bit back. during sessions yeah whereas a lot of time it can be just all out all the time if they're left to their own devices it's crazy, isn't it? And do you see the say? Do you see that same mentality in uh, female fighters as well? Yeah, I think it's, it goes across the board for all athletes. Um, and I think, based on my own experience with the the female athletes that I've worked with, uh, they tend to be, if anything, uh, more like I'm going to do every single thing possible here. Do you know and there's no off switch anything that needs to be done i'll do it if anything give me one percent difference that's it and i don't know if that's um just i've been there there's the people that have came to me but i think it tends to extend across the board um just again generally with fighters but particularly particularly with the female uh, fighters that i've worked with there's yeah that mentality where okay if, if i put my mind to it i can just stay pushing through anything and a lot of time it's okay we need to get you back off here or not stress too much about this or this thing you can relax a bit more about because yeah it's it's a i think it's a unique mindset that a lot of combat sport athletes have definitely and i'm going to really agree with that in terms of mindset because i would like to get into the psychological aspect of things as well and mm. um, i'm a big believer in psychology and i think that mindset has got a massive play in any kind of uh, competition prep yeah. um so so yeah definitely it's your mindset that just keeps on pushing and pushing and it's like if you've got to go and do three intense sessions at the gym then you're just going to go and do it aren't you yeah. Right. Okay, excellent. So moving on from that initial setup then, um, let's say that they've got a scheduled fight coming up. Um, how far out would you like to kind of have a look at their nutrition and, and realistically prep them for the fight? So in an ideal world, as long as possible. So ideally, if they didn't have a fight coming up, if we can get an athlete come in and start working with us when they don't have a fight scheduled, that they're just looking at their normal training and recovery, we can then start working on good quality habits that they can build in the long term. So then when they do get a fight booked, we're in a much better place. Uh, that said, if we're looking at a time frame of, okay, 
we need to start making some, say, body weight changes before this fight. Um, this depends on, obviously, what weight class they're planning to be in, where they've allowed their current body weight to get up to. And so we have some kind of distinct cutoff points that we like uh, athletes to be within so that we know, okay, a week out from your weigh-in, the maximum weight we want you to be is this. And then from there, we can work backwards depending on how many weeks we have to determine uh, how fast or slow we can diet them. So in an ideal world, we want that diet to be as slow in rate as possible. So losing uh, a low amount of body weight per week simply because that means we'll be able to have them in a smaller calorie deficit. A smaller calorie deficit means it's going to be better for their performance and recovery than if they're in a large calorie deficit. And so with that, we can work out, okay, um, to get to that, whatever our cutoff point is a week out from weigh-ins, you need to lose um, another four kilos. Uh, then we can say, okay, we've got the next kind of 12 weeks to do that. And then we can start working out, okay, what would we like to see that rate of, of weight loss over those 12 weeks on average? Are we going to do more at the start or are we going to split it evenly across those 12 weeks and so on? But just so we have a time frame then of, okay, we need to get down to this specific weight. Here's a kind of rough time frame of how much weight we can expect per week and then work from there. So it depends on where their kind of current body weight is sitting at. Um, but like, uh, like you said, the longer we have, the better, because if we can get them within, uh, the closer we can get them to hang around near their weight class and still be performing well in the gym, then that means less time dieting as the fight camp goes on. And that means better performance and recovery. So it really all depends. And even on an individual level, it can be quite variable of how long of a, I suppose, a, a fight camp they actually need. And a lot of that just comes down to themselves and their coaches. Um, we'll often get people that will just come to us saying that they've they've just booked the fight, they've a fight in eight weeks' time. Uh, can we help them make weight? Um, and oftentimes this can be someone who's allowed their weight to get far beyond normal or a bigger weight cut than usual. And uh, so those things can be a bit more tricky because we don't have uh, any previous data with this athlete, and now they're trying to do quite a, a large decrease in body weight. Um, we can get them there, but obviously if you want to do it optimally, uh, looking at nutrition as a long-term thing is probably going to be far more productive than I'm just going to talk to a nutritionist six weeks out from a fight and then stop. For sure. Absolutely agree. And in terms of when you change their nutrition, do you, like say you've got somebody who comes to you who thinks that they're eating healthy, you always get them, don't you? You know, oh, I do eat right. healthy. And then you look at it, it's like, yeah, okay, you might be doing, but you're under eating and this, that and the other. Sure. Once you start to change their meal timing around and obviously implement some more carbohydrates and things, which I'm assuming a lot of people would be cutting out as well from what you were saying, um, this new jump on the keto bandwagon type thing. Right. Um, once you change that meal timing around, do you see an a increase in their performance almost immediately, or will it actually take a couple of weeks, you know, to 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 ingrain that change? Yeah, pretty much within that first week, it's almost immediately noticeable to them. Um, yeah. Sometimes even within those first couple of sessions of, well, I'm actually going in with like full carbohydrate stores. I'm paying attention to having protein after my training session. So then my recovery is going to be better for my next session. Um, even little things like being a bit more detailed with their hydration. So like checking the color of their urine throughout the day to make sure they're keeping on top of their water intake. Uh, those things immediately within that first week, athletes will see it. Even making sure they're consuming enough food overall. Um, and particularly, like you say, if they've been under eating on carbohydrates or they haven't been uh, consuming enough after their first session of the day and then they go into that second session they just always feel tired a lot of that stuff can like you'll see an almost immediate benefit from um which is great for buy-in from the athlete because they oh this thing actually works and uh, i can kind of relax now and trust that <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing it's funny, isn't it? Because once I, I'm exactly the same when I have some athletes and I just say, right, we need to give you some more food. 
um, and even to help kind of make weight from you look at what they're doing. And then I give them more food and they say, this isn't going to work. You must be out of your mind. I was like, just trust me, you know, have it for a week. And then all of a sudden it's like, Jesus Christ, I feel amazing. And I feel this and the performance is great. And and it is, it's very funny it, then to get that buy-in. So again, psychologically, we have had it ingrained in ourselves that to lose weight, you need to eat less, do all of the cardio um, and kind of detriment your performance all the way because it is all about, you know, losing weight scale weight and that kind of thing um but actually turning it onto the head and saying to people not just in in fighting sports or athlete wise but just saying to general population clients no i'm not going to ask you to do cardio and i'm not going to ask you to cut out your carbohydrates i want you to do this right trying to get that buy-in is so difficult isn't it yeah and that's the thing it's it's the initial thing of people being a bit wary of oh i don't understand how this is going to work but once they try it and they see just how amazing it can be then everyone everything is relaxed it's every uh everything after that that you say someone is going to buy into it more and more and just have that trust in their coach which is just crucial um and particularly when we see this with the athletes that uh, making weight for a competition or for a fight is a particularly stressful thing for a lot of them, uh, particularly because they have um, maybe bad experiences in the past with weight cuts. Maybe they're not really too sure of what they're doing. They've kind of just been like doing random stuff they heard about. So they have no predictability of what their weight is going to be. So it's a bit of an unknown. And it can be quite a stressful time. And you add on top of that dieting, particularly the way that a lot of them do it, like this super harsh, like low calorie, low carb diets, it just creates all this stress and now suddenly they have a way that they're feeling better they're performing better they can now trust in a coach that everything is going to be okay and that reduction in stress is not only good for them and their recovery it's also just good from a perspective of uh less water retention as well which can be an issue for for fighters coming into that final weight cut too so um yeah getting getting that trust between coach and athlete is huge and something i'm, I'm sure you've seen over and over again with clients as well Definitely, definitely. It's interesting, very interesting. I love how the, the human mind works and psychological things. And you've always got that person on your shoulder kind of going, well, is it going to work? And then a monkey in your brain saying, yeah, possibly. And then the coach who's the Jiminy Cricket just saying, just come on, just trust me and all the rest of it. So right, yeah. you are as tied between a rock and a hard place sometimes, but it, it does work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So moving on from there then. So we've got their nutrition in place. We've got their meal timing in place as well. Um, just having a look at the nutritional pyramid that a lot of people are um, familiar with as well. Meal timing is obviously such a, a tiny thing in terms of body composition, but obviously we are looking at optimizing performance here. Mm. So with your fighters, if they are fighting two or three times a day, how do you do that meal timing in order to give them enough energy pre, but then enough substrates to recover from as well afterwards before going into their second training bout of the day? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it ties back to something we, we briefly touched on earlier of first getting a clear view of what their weekly training schedule looks like, putting some sort of prioritization on certain training sessions and looking at the goal of each training session. So the, 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 I suppose the important thing from an athlete perspective, if they're listening, that is uh, what a good SNC coach should probably be highlighting to them is that not every session across the week is you going as hard as you possibly can in that session. That's not going to be that productive. So across the week, there's going to be some that, sure, you need to push hard. There's going to be some conditioning sessions that you're going to have to push hard in. But you also, across the week, have sessions that might be more um, just skill-based, where there's no sparring element, but the athlete might be coming in and doing like some shadow boxing or working on a specific drill uh, with lots of rest time, where it's quite demanding to learn a new skill, but it's not that deeply intense. So they don't need to be as fueled up as much. Similarly, they could go for a recovery session across the week. So rather than just not do anything and be lying at home, something just to help the recovery come in, get moving. Maybe they're doing like some stretching or some moving again, maybe some shadow boxing, maybe a really light run. Um, there's all different scenarios you can think of where certain training sessions aren't going to be as tense as others. So once we have that, framework in mind we can say okay here's the ones that are most important that the athlete has a lot of energy full glycogen stores and really prioritize this training performance here's ones that the performance actually doesn't matter so much in so for example for this with a fighter might be 
on, uh, let's say, the bulk of their training has been done from Monday to Friday or into Saturday morning. And then either some stage on Saturday, they're going to go for a bit of a cardio session. Again, just a way to increase their expenditure a bit, help with making weight, or they just like the psychological benefits of doing a run. Now, for that particular uh, like low-intensity run that they're going for, their actual performance doesn't matter. Like how fast they actually do it or compared to previous doesn't matter. They're only doing it for energy expenditure and to use up some calories uh, or for the psychological benefits. So we don't need to prioritize that as much. Uh, so with that said, then we'll say, okay, uh, across the day, we want each of their main meals to be high in protein, which is kind of the same for we've talked about for other sports, uh, particularly getting that like a high dose of maybe 30 to 40 grams of protein, particularly after training sessions, just going to help with muscular recovery. Um, then we'll look at the session, the days that they're doing two sessions per day. Then what is the second session of the day looking like? Uh, how much energy they're going to need? Uh, depending on that, we'll probably have a large amount of carbohydrate after the first training session is done. Uh, maybe something even that's a bit more rapidly digestible, particularly if the next session is only four or five hours away. Uh, but this will also take into account, uh, so you asked about how would you feel for that first session of the day, perhaps. So this probably depends on what you did the previous day. So the previous day's nutrition, in, in addition to, say, breakfast on the morning of this current day, will depend on what you need to do in each of those meals. So really taking a, a longer-term view of what is the demands of this training session in terms of uh, how dependent on carbohydrate metabolism is it? Do we need a lot of glycogen or not? Do we need a lot of energy? Is it fairly uh, low going? What did I eat yesterday? What were my calories and carbohydrate intakes like? And then based on those decisions, you can decide, okay, for this particular meal before training, I'll need to have something like this. After training, I'll need to have high amount of protein, lots of uh, easily digestible carbohydrate. And then after the second training session of the day, again, what you consume after that will be high dose of protein. And then the rest will depend on, well, what training do you have set out tomorrow? If tomorrow is only a rest day, you might not need to consume any carbohydrate. If tomorrow has another good quality training session planned for the morning, then a good amount of carbohydrate in the evening after that second training session would be a good idea. So there's no kind of clear answer I can give. And I hope people were able to keep flow with that, some of those ideas. But essentially, it's just looking at what does the training week look like? How do we fuel for each training session based on what we've eaten before, uh, earlier in that day, and the previous day? And then just how do we match it up across the week? Yeah, interesting. I really like that. So it is more of like a seven day approach rather than just a 24 hour approach. Yes. It's, it's, it's good that way. So um, I'm, I like the idea of actually using your meal the night before as your pre workout. So um, I used to do that years ago because I used to train at six in the morning. Mm. Um, and I used to hate getting up and because I need to eat about 45 minutes to 60 minutes before I train. Any longer than that, I feel like I'm hungry and my performance isn't as good. Um, right. But any closer to that, and I feel like I've got a bloat going on. So yeah. um, what I used to do is I used to have a really heavy laden carbohydrate meal, which was probably oats and something like that, um, with some whey and a fat source to slow digestion down as well, probably about 30 minutes before I went to bed. Have that, then get up in the morning and just have like um, – a shake with some dextrin in or something along those lines about 30 mm. minutes before I trained. And then I went and trained and I found that everything was still really good because I still had good substrates in my system. Mm. Now, obviously I wasn't a fighter um, and I'm not a fighter. I'm, I was a bodybuilder. Oh, I am a bodybuilder at that time. So, but it's, so it's, it's, it's different horses for courses, isn't it? But um, I still implement that for my lifters and um, all some of my performance athletes. I've got a couple of rowers who like to row at 6am in the morning and, and I use that strategy as well. So it's nice to know that um, I'm doing something along the right lines um, that, that Sigma is promoting. So that, that's really good. I'm very happy with that. Yeah, it's an important point, and I think people often miss that because I'm sure you've got that question a lot from people not only in various different sports but just generally uh, across the board. People asking, well, what should I eat before a workout or what should I eat before training? And, and that question is kind of loaded because it, most people think of it as what should I be eating two hours before I go train? 
It's like, well, it kind of depends on what you had earlier in the day and what you had yesterday, which is what you just touched on. And if you fuel appropriately, then it changes what you might need. Um, and so this definitely works out well just as a, a tangent for particularly athletes in field sports like uh, football or rugby or so on, where, again, rather than thinking, okay, I have a big training session or a match uh, on at 11 a.m. and I need to get up early and have this like huge bowl of pasta or rice, you can get a lot of your carbohydrate fueling just done the day before, and then you just top it off with something smaller in the morning, and it's a bit more tolerable. Uh, and the same thing goes with exactly what you've outlined there. Get your bulkier carbohydrates in the night before. You then have pretty much full glycogen stores. You could just have something smaller then before you go train in the morning, and it's all good. So I think viewing pre-workout nutrition as a lot longer than just two hours of looking at it as a 24 hours before that training session is a, is a much better idea. Definitely. I really like that as well. So I'm glad that we touched on that because not a lot of people do talk about that. They talk about mm -hmm. peri-workout nutrition and that is pre, during, pre, pre, intra and post and then that's it. Right. You know, but actually looking to maximize performance it is really important to take the, the whole thing across a much wider spectrum. Okay. So moving swiftly on then to, uh, let's say a week out from a fight. Um, the how well let's have a look at the amount of weight that you are comfortable with in terms of like that cutoff sure so uh, to distill it down and, and kind of keep it brief depending yeah. <laughs> on the time frame between weigh-in and the fight if it's 24 hours or more between the weigh-in and the fight or competition we will say okay about 7 to 10 days before your weigh-in we want your weight at most to be 8% above your, your weigh-in weight. Um, so some people could probably tolerate a bit more, but it just gets a bit more risky the higher you above the 8% you go. Some people will perform best at a lower uh, weight cut. And so we might play around with actually athletes moving up weight classes and they actually perform better. So we put 8% as a, an approximate for most people. This is a good upper range of we don't want you dropping much more than 8% of your body weight over those final 7 to 10 days before your weigh-in. So now we have a good idea of where they need to be by that time point. And like I say, some people will be doing much better cutting just 5% versus 8% and so on. But that's our kind of upper figure that we give. Um, in some cases, you may see people go to like 9 10%, but we, I personally try and get all my athletes 8% as the cutoff. Um, for a two-hour weigh-in, so or maybe a three-hour, four-hour, something you might see for amateur boxing or for different martial arts tournaments, or if you look at something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you almost weigh in right before you go and step on the mat. That changes a lot of what you can do. So for something like a, uh, if a amateur boxer has maybe two to three hours uh, of it between their weigh-in and when they go and fight we'd probably be looking at something much smaller, maybe two, 3% of a, of a weight cut, simply because they don't have enough time to refill all their glycogen stores, enough time to re completely rehydrate. And so those things are gonna be absolutely crucial for performance. And so we would just get them to be much less of a weight cut. And if that means being a slightly higher weight class, then that's no problem for me, particularly for a boxer because, um, and this is kind of another side tangent, but compared to MMA, a boxer is more about their speed, moving, technique, and there's no kind of grappling element which would give a distinct advantage for someone being much larger. Um, so for shorter weigh-ins, it can be as small as like 2 3%. And for something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where your the time frame is even shorter between weigh-in and competition, it might be even less or maybe not much of a weight cut at all. Um, right. So they're, they're kind of the cutoffs and I'll... Uh, leave it at that yeah no that's fair enough because it's 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 interesting as well isn't it because you don't want to be at the especially for mma and grappling and things you don't want to be at the bottom end of your weight class so like you were saying if you've got a bump up to the to the next higher weight class that's going to put you at a disadvantage isn't it rather than being at the higher end of your mm. of your weight class itself yeah it's that really interesting kind of a again two things pulling in opposite directions the if you don't have to do a weight cut, you can actually physically perform at your best. So if you were to look at any metric in the gym that you can do, any kind of fitness test, whatever, your strength, 
if you don't do a weight cut and you eat loads of food before you go and do that, you will perform at your absolute peak. The more and more weight you cut, the, the more and more of a detriment to that performance you have. So it's kind of this weird balancing act of, um, oh, and we should mention that, like you said, at the same time, if you don't cut any weight, you're going to be at a disadvantage because you're literally smaller than your opponent. And generally, people who have more mass are going to have are going to be stronger and just physically bigger. So for fight sports, that makes a huge deal. Same thing with, with powerlifting, right? If you if there's a, a guy that's like cutting three kilos to get in the weight class, and you are like three kilos under the weight class, then even though you're competing together, that person's going to have much more likely to have much more muscle mass, which makes a, a distinct difference. So it's kind of that trade off between how much of a um, a lower weight class can I get into without having so much of a detriment to my performance that I actually am going to be worse off than if I was just in a higher weight class. And that's something we need to play around with, with certain athletes. And so that's why we I tend to have those kind of cutoff points that if you're within those, you should be pretty good that we can get you to make weight and still perform well. If you're way beyond that and it's becoming way too tough to make weight, then you're probably doing yourself an injustice and you're probably actually just big enough to get into the next weight class and still fill it out pretty well. So yeah, agreed. It's it's um it's a, a balancing act between those two, I guess. For sure. And um, having a look at the two hour weigh in then in that regard, what would you do if like say say every day your athlete as a lifestyle weighs in at um, six a.m. in the morning, but their official weigh in time on fight day is not until 8 a.m. in the morning. Would those two hours of weigh-in actually make a big difference at all? Uh, so potentially, yeah. So if the athlete can only weigh in at, say, 6 a.m. because they have to go to work and it's not viable for them to weigh in at the, you, the 8 a.m. weigh-in time, so all their data is based on 6 a.m., um, then there's definitely, and they're not consuming any water and food between the time they get up and that's 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., then there is a, depending on the strategy we've used to make weight, they probably can decrease weight a bit more during those kind of two hours, just purely from having more of uh, what what's ever in their body digested, having maybe small amounts of water loss, again, depending on if we've been restricting fluid intake the previous day and so on. So they can see a bit of a difference. Um, how much is going to be quite variable. Um, and for if if they've had to do a weight cut anyway, uh, the longer you go through a weight cut, proportionally less and less weight is going to come off each hour because you just don't have as much to lose. So at that stage, it might not be a dramatic amount, um, but ideally we'd, we'd want them to be um, at their kind of target weight or we know that when they wake up, whether that's at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., that we're going to be pretty much on point then. Um, and if we need to do something more, that would only be in the case of someone who is doing a 24-hour plus weigh-in where they use a sauna or something like that. For two-hour weigh-ins, I would tend to stay away from that. So if they've made weight by 6 a.m., then great. We can just ride that out. And if it, if it for whatever reason, drops too fast, we can obviously bring in a bit, uh, sip on a bit of water uh, so they just stay hovering right on the weight class by the time they actually go and weigh in. Fantastic. No, really like that. Okay, so let's have a look at um, your weight cutting strategies then in the last seven days. So mm. I know we love talking about this and we did a whole podcast on it on the TRA one as well. So I will put the link to that if we don't want to go too much in detail. Mm. But um, realistically, let's just have a look at the differences in your weight cutting strategies for men versus women. Um, because I, I have heard on or, or read a lot of studies as well in regards to um food manipulations don't work as well for women um but that was just a couple of studies that i did do um and that was more for powerlifters rather than for fighters so let me get your ideas on that yeah so um i i'll kind of keep the uh weight cutting strategies in the final seven days at maybe a bit shorter than our, our last conversation <laughs> yeah because uh, there was a lot of detail in there just for the sake of time but um just to get people kind of on some of the basics, what we're trying to do in those final seven days is use some strategies that will acutely drop your scale weight that aren't necessarily decreasing how much body fat or muscle mass you have. So the primary ways we're doing that is decreasing how much water you have in your body, decreasing how much glycogen or stored carbohydrate you have in your body, and decreasing how much 
fiber or residues in your gastrointestinal tract. And if we do those three things, we can see quite a marked decrease on a body weight scale that has nothing to do with actual fat mass or muscle mass or so on. So that's the kind of real kind of uh, what most people talk about when they're saying I'm making weight. They're using these strategies to rapidly drop their body weight that has nothing to do with actual tissue. So uh, and people are probably familiar with different strategies that are often used. So to decrease body water, for example, you might have a phase of loading up with a high amount of water for a number of days, restricting then for a day, and then you will actually lose more fluid. So you're basically just dehydration from restricting your water intake. You can also do dehydration via uh, induced sweating. So whether that's through exercise or people walking around in a sauna suit or getting into a sauna, various different methods people have probably heard of. That's the same idea, dehydrate by sweating out water. Uh, for the loss of glycogen, that's simply eating a low carbohydrate diet for like, final seven, 10 days, that will just allow you to lose glycogen weight from your muscle and liver. And there's water associated with some of that glycogen as well. So you lose a bit more weight there. So a couple of kilos can, can go from those already. And then the use of a low fiber, low residue diet for the last couple of days before you weigh in can decrease how much uh, residue stays in your gastrointestinal tract. So that actually will hold some weight as well. So people can again lose maybe uh, half a pound, a pound more, depending on how much uh, their habitual fiber intake is. So these are the strategies we induce. Uh, to get on to kind of uh, the, the kind of real crux of your question around gender differences in how that final week looks and how weight cutting strategies may have a different effect. The, the big one that I'm sure most female athletes are aware of is probably... Um, fluctuations in water weight particularly across the menstrual cycle and really it goes beyond that looking at the final week and basically planning ahead and collecting a lot of data on the athlete themselves to be able to account for okay typically at what times in my cycle do i personally see increases in water retention uh how much does that typically be and then when do i typically see that decrease um there are some like generalities. So if we take, um, again, in a kind of very simplified manner, think of the, the menstrual cycle as this like on average 28 day cycle, two phases, your follicular phase and your luteal phase. You have the, probably the, the week of that cycle that most females will associate with more water retention will be the, the final week or the, the last week of that luteal phase uh, just before they get their period. So that or that PMS week where they have most of the symptoms uh, of PMS, they can see quite large increases in water weight. So that said, how much it increases by and how long that persists varies dramatically from uh, athlete to athlete. And I've seen this quite it's like crazy about how little some can actually increase their body weight by versus how large some of them can be by, like from differences of one to like, eight or nine pounds in other it's people. It, it's crazy differences. So the, the important thing is to keep as much data as you can over time. So each month you're keeping data, you can start to see, okay, it's predictably this amount all the time happens in this week. So a lot of it will be that final week of the menstrual cycle. There can also be some water retention in typically the second week of the cycle as well. So this is just before ovulation happens. So you get kind of this increase in estrogen that um, essentially causes a bit more water to be held, uh, whereas the the final week of the menstrual cycle is due to a decrease in progesterone. But none of that stuff is like super important. Basically, there are the two time points where you're likely to see more water weight. And then in weeks one and three, you typically tend to see that drop away. Um, so what, from a practical level, what do we do about that? Like I said, keeping really good data consistently every month, try and look for trends for the individual because there's, it varies so much and to see, okay, on these specific weeks, this is when I'm likely to experience this increase in, in water weight and so on. And then once you know you have a fight booked by keeping track of when your uh, cycle is, you can plan ahead and see, okay, this is roughly going to fall at the end of this week of my cycle. And you can kind of know what your water weight is going to do and what that might mean for what you're going to need to get your body weight to 
many weeks in advance so that you have that bit of, uh, of wiggle room. Um, then there's other stuff that people will, will probably ask about of um, they would have heard about people using, say, a contraceptive pill as a way to get around this, right? Um, and this is an area I'm not going to give too much uh, advice in because they should probably talk to a doctor about it as well because on one end, if you with certain contraceptive pills, sure, you can get rid of so, as much of that fluctuation as there is, right? You don't get the same changes in estrogen and progesterone as you would if you weren't on the pill. And so you can kind of blunt those big water fluctuations. Um, however, there are certain types of um, uh, contraceptive pills that may or at least have been associated with, with some weight gain after someone st first starts taking them. So to think, okay, I have a fight in four weeks, I'll just start taking a pill now is like playing a pretty dangerous game. Yeah, uh, sure. So I would say, yeah, if, and probably they should be doing it beyond uh, just trying to make weight for a fight, making that decision as well. Um, but just be aware that if a, a, an athlete is, is either on a contraceptive pill or not, we'll have some difference there in terms of how much fluctuates. Um, but yeah, it's a tough one to navigate. It's just really about how much data can we collect? How can we plan ahead for this? How can we have a, uh, fairly reliable numbers of how much it's going to change for this particular female athlete and then work from there. Excellent. Really interesting. Okay. I like that. Okay. So last two questions, um, because I know that we are coming up on time and they've got loads to do. Um, so last two questions. So they've weighed in, they've got two hours to refuel before they go and fight. Um, you have a special Sigma concoction drink or a shake. Um, would you just give us the basis of that and the scientific knowledge behind it? Sure. So really, this can be, for, it doesn't have to be from the shake I, I propose, but it's just an easy way to essentially uh, refuel them with the things that you would have restricted before the weight cut. So water, carbohydrates, and electrolytes. Anything that's going to do that is going to be productive. So the shake that I, I talked about is basically just getting those in the right amounts. So uh, water with a certain amount of carbohydrate powder, some um, electrolyte powder in there as well, maybe a scoop or two of creatine if people uh, want to include that. Um, how much they need to uh, consume in terms of overall carbohydrates and fluid intake is going to depend again on how much weight they cut and how the time frame between uh, weigh in and fight. So for example, for a boxer who has only two hours um, between say a weigh in and a fight, that's not much time to really restore carbohydrate. So for that athlete, we wouldn't have put them on a really low carb diet for the last seven to 10 days because we don't want to completely deplete their glycogen. So we want them to be a bit higher in body weight, not cut as much weight, but still have more carbs in their system. So we'll still have some carbohydrates after their weigh in, but probably not as much or uh, certainly not as much as we'd have for say an athlete with 24 hours because we would have completely depleted them with glycogen to get all that uh, out. So yeah, anything that's going to provide you with enough water, electrolytes, and carbohydrate is going to be the way to go. Whether you want to use sports drinks uh, or sports drinks mixed with water, whether you want to make your own, like I recommend with water and bags of electrolyte powder and carbohydrate powder, uh, they're all good ways to go. Um, and the reason I just use that as opposed to say just a solid meal is particularly after a weigh-in when the athlete is quite depleted, particularly for a 24-hour weigh-in, it can be hard to digest solid food at that time point. And so it's easy just to get something that will get quickly into the system and isn't going to have the same demands on their gastrointestinal tract. Um, so yeah, that's the basis of what you're trying to do in, in that kind of refueling period. Perfect. Okay. So then that's done. The fight's been done. Um, they've obviously walked away with a win because their nutrition has managed to do that. Um, however, they are going to be injured. So what about nutritional strategies to recovery from injury? Yeah, this, this is a really interesting one, I think. And I've started to pay a bit more attention to over the past couple of years with athletes is the, um, because it's quite an intuitive thing to do some of the mistakes that we see and intuitively like I'm sure I would have done this in the past as well is that an athlete gets injured so they can't now train at their usual workload their training is either completely gone or dramatically reduced in how much they're doing uh, if they have quite a serious injury maybe their just overall mobility is decreased like if they break their leg and they can't literally walk around uh, or go down to the shop decreased 
amount of energy expenditure. And so the often thing that most athletes will jump to is, okay, well, I need to just stop eating as much food. I need to eat quite a low amount of calories. Or a lot of times what you might see is, well, seeing as I'm injured now and I can't train, I may as well do something productive to help me. So what if I diet now for the next number of weeks? And then when I go back training, I'll be leaner and I won't have to diet then. And while I get that logic, it can actually be quite uh, detrimental to recovery from certain injuries. So what you want to do is keep with a super high protein intake is probably going to be useful, but also make sure that you're not in a calorie deficit. So you may decrease your overall calorie intake because if you're doing a ton of training, you needed like 3000 calories a day to fuel that. Now you're doing hardly any, you might only need like 2200 just to be at weight maintenance. But whatever that number is, you want to keep your body weight the same or maybe even allow it to drift upwards. You don't want your body weight decreasing during a phase of injury because that means you're in a deficit, you're dieting, and you're not giving resources to actually recover as fast as you probably could. So I would say uh, be at least at calorie maintenance, maybe even slightly higher. Don't try and diet even as tempting as it is because you want to do something productive, I would say stay away from that. Focus on getting the injury healed and uh, through enough calories and enough protein. Um, then you can look at like maybe certain micronutrients may have a, a small impact, but overall the principles are going to be the same. Make sure you're getting plenty of uh, micronutrients uh, in your diet from good quality food sources and um, yeah allow the process to occur. So the biggest thing is probably overall calories and protein intake. Perfect. Really like that. And I really wanted to cover that because of the exact same thing, because of the exact thing that you said there. The minute people are injured, they're not going to be moving around as much. They all of a sudden think, shit, I'm going to put on a load of weight. So I'm just going to cut calories and just do that from that side of things so I don't let my weight go upwards. So I'm really happy that we did cover that, actually, because I think it is an important aspect to cover from, mm. from any aspect, not just from a fighter, but from maybe a powerlifter who's torn a, a glute muscle or, you know, a, a bodybuilder who's torn a pec because you see loads of them these days mm. so brilliant okay danny so um I, I'm, I'm aware that we are kind of up on time now so i really appreciate you um you speaking to me for an hour from your comfy lounge in vienna by the way <laughs> so danny's had a little bit of a change of scenery from the last time that we we spoke um and it's beautiful and hot over there so i'm going to let you go and enjoy the sunshine so just before yeah. you disappear just let people know where they can find you where they can listen to sigma and um if they can come to you as a fighter for their nutrition yeah, sure. So almost everything is just going to be up on the website. So just go to sigmanutrition.com. You get all the podcast articles, information about coaching, uh, the weight cutting book, all that stuff is up there. Uh, if you are looking for the podcast specifically, just search Sigma Nutrition Radio on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, it's on all that stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I'm relatively easy to find on social media. Um, Instagram, if people are on that. Uh, Danny Lennon underscore Sigma or uh, Twitter nutrition Danny um, or just type in my name into Facebook and you can find me pretty easily there too brilliant so um that's it from me and don't fear the wait and that's it from danny as well danny thank you ever so much again for giving up your time i will include all of your links in the comment section on youtube as always guys and if you've got any questions for myself or danny or his team over at sigma then please put them in the comments and we will try and get back to them as soon as possible so um that's it for another episode and i will catch up with you guys next week danny take care matey thank you so much vicky